I'm working on uh, the Legion programming model, but uh, saying I lead it is, uh, is, is, is quite a bit of a stretch. Um, so we partner with uh, Stanford University, Alex Aiken, um, is, uh, is co-PI on a number of projects that I'm working on, um, and uh, uh, most of the core uh, Legion development and some of the ideas were um, originally developed at, uh, at Stanford University. Uh, but we're partnering uh, with them at Los Alamos, and now uh, NVIDIA is also, um, uh, is also working directly with us. Um, we collaborate with many others, of course, um, uh, but I, I probably don't have time to, to mention them all uh, right here. Um, so jumping right in. So what's kind of the motivation behind our work on, on the Legion programming model or programming system? Um, well, we believe that uh, programming HPC uh, systems is hard today and that it's only going to get harder. Um, we can start doing uh, work on small-scale proxy applications, um, even you know, single physics applications, but as we start to uh, reach for harder application domains um, or having to bring in external library dependencies, um, getting optimal performance and scalability on these large systems is quite hard. Um, and so, Really, we, uh, one of the things that our team at Los Alamos is focusing on is uh, full system um, issues, uh, data awareness, and approved uh, productivity um, within the programming model. And I'll, get, I'll touch on some of these in just a bit. Um, uh, I'll reiterate that we don't believe programming in the small is the challenge. Um, so uh, working on proxy applications doesn't really, um, uh, doesn't really, uh, expose all of the challenges that our applications face. It's good for doing micro-level optimizations, um, but those may or may not benefit you uh, in your total application. Uh, we're working on end-to-end -end awareness of the application space, so that includes things like in situ, multi-physics, um, uh, uh, visualization, so not just focusing on one component of the, of the application. Um, and we're targeting extremely large-scale systems. So, uh, at Los Alamos, we've, we've recently uh, uh, married the two uh, halves of uh, Trinity. Uh, we have a 9,000 uh, node, um, well, about 10,000 node Haswell partition and 10,000 node uh, Intel uh, Xeon 5 uh, partition. Um, and we have applications um, that are running at very large scale um, on, on those systems. So those applications are our target, um, as well as uh, broader engagement with applications in Office of Science. Um, and, but these systems uh, expose challenges in terms of hardware dynamics. A lot of these have uh, frequency scaling, adaptive routing in the network, so predictable performance is just often not there. Um, we have software dynamics in which uh, individual services that we link into our applications may fire up when we call them and use an undetermined amount of resources that are, is very difficult to reason about as an application developer. Um, and so uh, when we think of programming models, um, we think of what do we have to deliver, right? Um, and a lot of our work is longer term, um, and so uh, you'll see some of these are aspirational, um, but, uh, but these are some of the, the truths that we ho hold dear, so to speak. Um, so we have to be fa fast. We're high-performance computing. Um, we have to be performance portable, uh, if, uh, if at all possible, across many different kinds of machines over m many generations. We have applications that are decades old um, that, uh, that we've continued to bring forward on uh, modern architectures, and we'll continue to do so. Um, and we have to increase programmer productivity uh, through what we think is a, program a programmability issue. Um, trying to drive towards exposing sequential semantics um, to remove the burden of uh, reasoning about parallel execution uh, from the application developer. Um, well, can we fulfill all of our programming modeling goals today? Um, perhaps uh, to some degree, um, but the cost is programmer pain. So if we uh, take a, 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 a control flow graph uh, from, uh, this is just a single mini-app, so this isn't a full application. Um, this is the control flow graph of one time step on one node um, of, of a mini-application. And so we start asking, do you want to be the one that, actually, that has to schedule this graph for efficient computation? Um, 
do you want to reschedule this graph every time you go to a new architecture? We think of that in terms of performance portability. Do you want to be responsible for actually generating this graph, um, which is what you do when you actually write um, your program imperatively? Um, today, this is the programmer's responsibility. Um, we're pushing for technologies that allow us to move some of those responsibilities to the programming system. Um, and so, to do so, we have to really think about what the abstractions are that we expose to the application developer. Um, so, if we look at, um, I would argue that in some sense, we're using the wrong, wrong abstractions if we want to achieve these goals. Um, so, this is a pretty simple example um, of uh, uh, what an application developer might do with uh, asynchronous send receive semantics uh, to help hide latency, which we know is important on modern architectures because um, network latencies aren't getting much better. Um, but we've got more and more work that needs to um, occur between those um, sends received. Um, and so, what we see here is an asynchronous receive of some data value x, an execution of an unrelated, um, on an unrelated uh, data element y. Um, this is a, an attempt to actually hide the, the, um, the overhead of this asynchronous receive, or the, uh, receiving that data. We synchronize, and then we can call our function f of x on that data. So a pretty trivial example. Um, but there, it poses some questions, right? Um, if I'm writing this application, how much work do I actually need to put in do work for each specific machine architecture to actually hide that, um, that asynchronous receive? Um, is it performance portable? So if I go to a new architecture and I have fewer cores or my latency is different or my bandwidth is different, did I put enough work here? Or do I parameterize the amount of work and the message size uh, uh, for that particular architecture? Um, when does forward progress occur? So you might actually have to think about um, if I do this asynchronous receive, if it's with uh, most MPI implementations and the data size over, is over a certain limit, uh, what we call the eager limit or the rendezvous limit um, or the rendezvous threshold, um, this receive may not even start until um, later on in the sync, um, uh, in, in that the, uh, the receive may not have been, um, may not be matched um, by, the, uh, 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 by the sender, or from the sender. And then what if you actually have more things happening in do work? Um, so this brings up kind of a composability problem. Um, what if I have data movement happening here? What if this is calling out to a linear algebra library and actually um, doing more uh, communication and more computation. How do you reason about uh, scheduling those computations and those data movements um, as well? And how do you actually reason about what resources are in use? Um, in this simple example, this asynchronous send, asynchronous receive, followed by this do work, um, is introducing additional memory overheads potentially um, because some of that message may be buffered within the underlying software stack. Um, and that's not directly exposed to the application. Um, and is it module, uh, modular in that can I actually, um, can I bundle this um, up into a library and then have another application um, uh, compose on top of that? And can that application then reason about what resources are in use, what asynchronous operations are in flight? Um, and I would argue uh, that it's, that's very difficult. Um, and I, I won't get into the details on, on fault handling, but um, these types of semantics actually uh, make fault handling, handling uh, uh, quite difficult. So uh, what we've been working on within, the, cons uh, within uh, the Legion project is to drive towards uh, an area where application developers can just provide a functionally correct application code um, with sequential semantics, so you don't have to reason about send, receive, and uh, uh, SPMD style programming, um, and then a mechanism in which we can actually map that um, functionally correct application code to a particular architecture. Um, so essentially a separation of concerns. Um, we think of that, uh, this um, specification of the application as a legion program um, with sequential semantics. 
um, and the actual mapping or um, uh, uh, optimization of that on a particular architecture as a mapping construct within Legion. So you can have your application developer or computational scientist working on the program and maybe they're partnering with a computer scientist or another computational scientist that knows the machine architecture quite well um, and can then optimize it through a separate interface um, from the application. So we don't solve the, the very difficult problem of how to arbitrarily schedule a graph on an arbitrary system, um, but we provide mechanisms where you can separate those concerns from the application developer and the computer or computational scientist. Um, and we think of that as the Legion programming system. Um, and the Legion programming system actually manages extraction of parallelism from that application, management of data within the um, within the uh, uh, within the system, um, dealing with data dependent uh, behavior within the application, and scheduling uh, uh, both uh, the uh, parallelism that's extracted via tasks and the data movement uh, to high latency. And so we think of it as a throughput oriented system. So at a high level, um, you have tasks, regions, and a mapper um, within uh, with, within Legion. A task is the execution model. It describes the parallel execution uh, elements um, and the algorithmic operations uh, with sequential semantics. But those tasks may be executed out of order. Um, the, the data model is uh, what we think of as a logical region, which is a cross product between an in-dimensional index space and a field space. So you can think of it as structive arrays or array of structs but it's purely logical um, in that it doesn't result in, uh, immediately in, an, in a, physical a physical instantiation of your data on a memory in the system. Um, that's done through a mapping operation. And the runtime's free to move the data throughout the system during, ex uh, during execution. Um, each task uh, describes uh, privileges uh, that it will need on a logical region or a partitioning of a logical region. And this exposes enough information to the runtime then to extract parallelism um, through uh, generation of a data flow graph and execution of that graph from the description of your program. Um, I'll skip through this uh, pretty quickly. Um, so what the Legion runtime system, um, the, the, I think the big innovation um, that, that is uh, provided by the Legion runtime system is its ability to dynamically um, do analysis of your uh, apparently sequential semantics and extract parallelism from that. Um, going over the data model briefly because it's, uh, it's, it's critical to the overall programming model um, is you have an uh, unbounded set of rows, uh, an in-dimensional index space, um, and a bounded set of columns, um, which we think of as fields. Um, you can partition this data, so you can provide, um, uh, say, an initial primary partitioning of your data across indices um, or across fields, what we think of as field slicing. Uh, and then you generate tasks, right, tasks that actually operate on those regions. And you can then um, execute tasks that operate on independent partitions. Um, and this, is, this allows the, uh, the runtime then to extract the parallelism. Each task, as I said before, must specify exactly which field they're operating on um, and, uh, and the partition, in this case, that they're, um, that they're executing on. So two tasks that are operating on two separate partitions um, and two separate fields, let's say, um, can be operating completely in parallel. You can have two tasks operating on the same partition and two different fields, and they can operate in parallel. Um, and as long as you expose this to the runtime, it, it actually manages the execution of those tasks concurrently. Um, the tasks are actually launched in program order. So the description of those functions, if you will, in your application are queued uh, to the runtime system. And then the runtime system does this analysis based on the region requirements that are specified by those tasks and may, um, may actually um, change the order of execution and run them concurrently. Um, much of the, imp uh, mu mu much of the uh, uh, inspiration for this comes from uh, uh, concepts from out of order um, 
processor execution. So moving um, the the, con uh, the, con the the capabilities of an out of order hardware processor into a runtime environment. Um, so we actually have showed um, some compelling results, um, and uh, probably the the biggest one to date has been our work on S3D, um, which is a full scale um, combustion application written in Fortran. Um, we took the entire right hand side function of that uh, combustion application as well as all the chemistry kernels, um, about 100,000 lines of code, and move that over into the Legion C++ programming model. Um, we did not move the, all the infrastructure for setting up the initial mesh, um, for um, populating the chemical species in that mesh um, uh, into Legion. We let the MPI version do that. Um, the MPI code and the, and the Fortran code do that. Um, but when, it's going, when it actually wants to hand over and do multiple time steps, um, once everything's set up, it bulk synchronously changes the entire application to Legion, and then Legion manages all the execution from there on out, which is where all of the computation really is, or the, um, the majority of it. Um, this resulted in a 2 to 3x uh, performance increase over the best of um, breed at the time, the, or even today, of a traditional programming model um, implementation of MPI plus OpenACC. Um, and this is, these results are on the Titan supercomputer. Um, I, it was 7x faster than MPI only, um, which is somewhat of an unfair comparison since we are um, not using the GPU in that case um, within the MPI only version. Um, but in the OpenACC version, it is using the GPU and we're still able to, um, to beat it out um, by a significant margin. Um, we're also able to scale to a new level. Um, this is a, a weak scaling plot. Um, we were able to go beyond uh, 9,000 nodes and push all the way up to 13,000 nodes in this simulation um, using uh, the Legion programming model. Um, and they were actually able to do um, a new uh, uh, a new uh, uh, combustion simulation uh, that wasn't possible before a um, uh, uh, higher number of chemical species um, uh, for a primary reference fuel that hadn't been done previously um, because of uh, this work. Um, and we actually embedded in situ visualization and analysis within this code um, with 1% uh, overhead. Previously, it was 10% overhead. Um, because those in situ analysis was then uh, essentially codified as, um, as tasks, um, and the runtime was able to efficiently schedule those during what would otherwise be dead time um, uh, in the application, whereas the traditional approach would bulk synchronously stop on the in situ uh, step. Um, all these techniques you can do in your application um, if you want to manage all of the concurrency and the scheduling logic. Um, we argue that it's becoming increasingly, increasingly more difficult as you, um, as the complexity of your application grows. Um, so, I will jump in. Uh, yes, I've got a question. Thank you. How much time did you spend for integrating Legion into the code, into the Fortran code? Oh, I don't know the estimates. So, Sean, uh, Mike Bauer and Sean Treichler did uh, much of the work. Um, who are the uh, primary authors of Legion and Realm. Realm is the lower level runtime um, months. Um, probably a few months, I would say two to three months. Um, and then uh, multiple iterations after that to, um, you know, to deal with issues and performance debugging and everything else that comes with. It's hard to put a, a number on it because um, it is not, you know, one, it, it, I'll be, um, the first to admit it's not simple to move your application to the Legion C++ interface. Um, and uh, it was also being, the runtime in the programming system was being um, developed in tandem with that application porting. And so an issue would be hit at scale and then not a complete redesign, but a lot of assumptions were wrong and things were changed. And so, um, but, but it's not a trivial effort for a large application to move to, um, to uh, a runtime system such as this. Um, but, uh, but we are working on a next generation application um, at Los Alamos built upon Legion, multi-physics application. Um, and uh, 
and we're um, uh, we're in the process of, uh, for instance, developing uh, Fortran bindings um, and better Fortran interoperability, um, so that leaf tasks, um, tasks that aren't executing other tasks, can automatically be written in Fortran and executed by the Legion runtime. Um, we can actually provide the data directly in column major ordering to the task, and so it can just use standard iteration uh, like you would in Fortran. Um, so the things we're doing to try to lower the, the barriers to entry, um, but I don't want to oversell that it's, uh, that you just pick it up and run with it and, and, and uh, you know, it takes a week to port your code. That's, that's definitely not the case. Um, so uh, with that in mind, in fact, um, I'm going to focus on Regent. Um, so Legion is our C++ runtime and our C++ API um, to this programming model. Um, instead of uh, walking you through all of the idiosyncras idiosyncrasies of dealing with the C++ interface, um, we're going to use Regent, which is um, essentially like Lua or Python, um, and it's a compiler, and it lowers directly to uh, the underlying Legion runtime system, um, which I think will be slightly more productive uh, for, the, uh, for this venue. But hopefully some of the concepts um, uh, you'll pick up as we move forward. Um, so Legion is the C++ runtime. It's a programming model. Um, but Regent is a programming language built for uh, Legion. Um, and we'll focus on that. Um, it provides sequential semantics. Um, it's throughput-oriented, so it tries to get as many tasks going concurrently with data movement um, to, uh, to, to deal with uh, uh, latency hiding. Um, and the runtime is making dynamic decisions about what to execute and where to move data. Um, so I will... I think I touched on all of those things. Um, I should point out that um, uh, it has, uh, uh, it's highly asynchronous. Um, so uh, the order of your, um, um, uh, the way you uh, describe your applications and your um, apparently sequential code um, will not necessarily be realized in the execution. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll touch on that as we go through some examples. Um, Regent is actually embedded in Lua, um, and it's a compiler. Um, it also uses Terra that can lower directly to LLVM, um, and, uh, and then it's built upon the Legion runtime. So we can actually expose through Lua um, all of the C APIs, so C.printf works, um, uh, and it can actually take what would generally be a dynamically generated function and lower it to Terra um, and get machine-optimized code. Um, but the idea is to increase productivity of using this system. So, first of all, did everybody get an email from one Chan um, or from a, a Gmail address with a login information? Okay, so um, I'll switch over here for a moment. Um, you should be able to um, SSH to Let's see, I've got an alias. And bear with me as I go through this, since this is the first time I've actually run through these in a public setting. So there's a, a um, you, you'll see that you can SSH to bootcamp.region-lang.org. And uh, um, you'll, you should have your username uh, listed there um, and a password. Um, so are people actually logged on to the Amazon Cloud instance? The first thing that you should see are um, uh, probably a folder or directory called ATP ESC or final. What do you see? You have public underscore HTML. Do you also have ATP ESC? Excellent. OK, great. So let's go into the ATP ESC directory. And let's first go to uh, the, um, we'll go to the overview. Yep. So go to overview and uh, open up uh, one.rg in your favorite editor, preferably Emacs. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and 
and take a look at that. Um, you might want to background that and then try to actually execute it. So most of the examples today are just going to be looking at the code and executing it to kind of give you an, uh, a, um, a, a flavor. So um, um, Q sub that with r1.sh, which is the run script. So you should just get a command back that says, hey, I've huh? So take a look. You'll now have, if you um, do like an LSLTR, you should have an output, um, r1.sh062. And it'll say the answer is 42. Of course it is. Um, so so uh, this is a, a pretty simple example. Um, I will uh, open it up here, and we'll take a look at it together. Let's see. So the only thing, this, uh, this has a single task, right, um, called main. So this, you can think of this as uh, just the main uh, that you would have, or a top-level task in your application. Um, and it's using uh, c.printf, so we can use um, uh, C bindings um, directly through uh, this compiler. Um, and then it actually starts the application. So pretty simple. I think um, uh, you should have gotten this output. Um, it's not a very complex application. But if we compare it to um, something a bit more uh, detailed. So let's look at uh, 2.rg. And again, a single task, um, task main. Um, and it's just doing a, a simple for loop. Um, uh, the syntax should look familiar to those that are um, familiar with Lua or Python. Um, it's essentially the same. Um, and it's executing this, um, uh, this one task and then completing. Um, let's see. So the next step will be um, looking at tasks. So the uh, within Regent, the, the, the unit of parallel execution is a, is a task, and the task main is just the top-level task. But those tasks, can, uh, the top-level task can then execute subsequent tasks underneath it. Um, and we'll get to that in just a bit. Um, they run until they block or terminate, um, and ideally they don't block. And we'll try to get into a few profiling examples to show you uh, where they potentially will. Um, blocking means a task can't actually continue until another task completes, um, and so the task stops running, and you'll see that in some of the profiling, profiling information. Um, blocking doesn't necessarily prevent other independent work from occurring, though, so this isn't always a bad thing. You can have other tasks filling up the resources, um, uh, but in general, we actually want to avoid blocking. Um, Task can call subtasks, uh, which uh, I mentioned earlier. We think of this as nested parallelism. Um, and we use the terminology of parent and child tasks. Um, so all tasks have a single parent, um, a, 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 sorry, a single ancestor going all the way back to the top level task, or in the case of region, uh, main. Um, so uh, we'll look at another example um, of this, uh, where we actually have um, the main task executing um, subsequent tasks. So in this example, we have uh, a task uh, summer, which is going to uh, return a future of sum. Um, and then we pass that future into another task tester. So we can compose these um, naturally within, um, within the application. And I believe we have an example of that in source code form. see, under tasks. So take a look at, um, we'll first take a look at under tasks, take a look at 1.rg. This is a pretty simple example uh, where we have uh, one task summer um, that's uh, going to revi uh, that's going to um, going to return a value sum, and then we have some conditional logic that eventually gets us to the answer of 42. If we compare that to another um, to the example that I just had on the screen, though, um, 
we actually have a more complex example where we can actually, uh, let's see, have uh, summer um, being passed, the future, the future return value of summer being passed to tester. And those are two different uh, independent tasks, uh, two different tasks that are defined within your application. You'll see the first one here, task summer. Um, that's just a simple for loop embedded. Um, it will print out when it's done. Um, another task uh, tester um, that will, uh, sorry, another task uh, um, subtractor um, that, uh, that can be executed uh, and uh, returns uh, subtractor is done. And then another task tester which has some conditional logic. And we look at the, the main task, which is again the top level task. It's first executing summer passing the future to tester, and, uh, and then hopefully it gets the right answer. So let's first take a look at um, Q subbing. Um, uh, let's see, under the task directory. Um, let's try to execute uh, the first one, 1.rg. So you'll see actually a couple of different run scripts. So I'll explain them briefly. Um, R1.sh is going to just execute 1.rg. Um, RP1.sh is going to execute 1.rg, but it's going to also add a profiling, profiling information uh, with it. And so we'll take a look at that um, as the next step. So let's QSub um, R1.sh, make sure we actually get the right result. Forty-two in your output, right? Now let's do make prof. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, Q sub um, again. The uh, R P one. Yeah, R P one dot S H first. Make sure that completes, and then do a make prof, and it should tell you. Uh, where it actually put that profiling information. Um, in mine, it put it under user G shipman public HTML prof.8. So let's take a look. Uh, you might have a different, um, you're going to definitely have a different moniker, whatever moniker uh, was uh, that you logged in with. Um, and it might be prof without a suffix at this point if it's the first time you've run uh, the prof example. It'll increment there uh, uh, each time in the future now. Um, so if you open up a web browser, and uh, you want to go to bootcamp.regent-lang.org tilde mon uh, sl uh, forward slash moniker, tilde moniker, sorry, um, slash prof uh, in your case. Um, I'm using prof.8 because I've run a few of these. And from that, you should get a profiling plot. So you should have bootcamp.regent-lang.org um, slash tilde your moniker slash prof. Mine has a point 0.8 here. If the output that you got from your um, execution was different, it might be prof.1, prof.2 if you'd played around with this previously. Does every, do, do, do some folks at least have the web page up? Okay. Okay. We're getting there. Cool. So uh, before you click around too much, the first thing I would recommend is dragging over this horizontal bar. This doesn't always work perfectly. We're still working uh, 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 on, on the interface. Um, but if you drag over from here to there, let's say. And you have to be careful. You have to click it at the right spot. If you get into this up bar, uh, uh, you'll, uh, uh, it, it won't let you click down. But now it's kind of provided me with a time slice of, that applica of the application. And it's showing me a couple of things. One, the actual node that it's um, executing tasks on, node 0, um, which is a CPU node, um, and node 0, 
uh, utility processors um, on that node. So I can expand node zero, and I can expand node, uh, uh, node zero CPU and node zero utility. You'll see first that in this, in this example, we have one processor that we're executing Legion tasks across, your application tasks. And we have one processor that we use as a utility processor on that node to do all the dynamic uh, analysis, the program analysis, and management of data movement within the system and execution of tasks. Yes? I have three processors here. Uh, which, uh, which example did I, you run? I did the one you told me, but. What's that? RP1. RP1.sh under tasks? Yep. OK, that's interesting. OK, I might have pulled up the wrong, uh, the wrong example in mine. Um, I'd have to go back and we could take a look at the, um, at the source code and the execution. Script. Ah, I should actually have more. I should have, because um, I'm giving it four CPUs to the low-level runtime here. You see that in this, uh, in this script. I'll continue moving on, though, um, uh, so that we can get to some of the other um, examples. But let's look first at, um, if I hover over under my CPU proc 1, or any of the CPU procs, you should have a blue bar. This is actually main um, in the application. And it's telling us the, total st the start time and the end time. Um, it's, and it's showing us dead time in the application. For instance, here where it's executing summer, and then later on here where an unnamed task is being executed by summer, um, and then main is, is joined back, um, and then we have waiting, and then execution of main again. Um, and in each one of these, we get a pictorial representation of the utilization of CPU utilization uh, during those windows. But we see that there's a lot of dead time in this example. Um, and so one of the first things that you do when you start writing uh, Legion programs is identifying where the dead time is. Um, because you need to uh, uh, have enough task parallelism in your application to hide the overheads of both the runtime as well as the underlying system in terms of moving data throughout the system. So let's take a look. Um, so we took a look at, uh, at Legion Prof. Um, the web output from that shows us um, what each process is doing on a timeline. Um, uh, each, op uh, each operation uh, within the application is showed on a time interval. Um, and we actually color code different types of operations um, within, uh, within the application. And any white space uh, is idle time, um, in particular on those top level um, uh, uh, plots that you saw in uh, CPU zero, um, uh, for, uh, for instance. Um, so we did this, uh, this simple example of uh, rp1.sh. Um, let's try rp2.sh and see if we have a different result. First, if we take a, I'll take a look at um, 2.rg. This one has a bit more task parallelism in it. Um, we have uh, tester will end up invoking summer based on that dependency of its, um, of its future. Um, so let's run uh, qsub rp2.sh. And do another make prof. Um, and I have a prof9. Let's see if I get the right output now. I'll go back to my web browser. And again, I'll slice off just the areas that I'm interested in. Um, we can ignore all the startup time. And in this case, I have a color-coded main uh, running on processor 3. Um, this is an independent core. Uh, and then I have uh, my application tasks, if you will, summer um, and tester uh, and subtractor uh, running on uh, CPU processor 2. Um, and I see that uh, we have a dependency 
um, on these tasks within main, so main doesn't actually complete until all of those other tasks complete. Um, and we have a dependency um, in this case of uh, um, between summer and tester um, on, those, uh, on those executions. So uh, this showed us two different uh, tasks or three different tasks uh, running in parallel um, or running uh, uh, across the system. Um, but how do we actually map tasks? Well, in this, uh, in this example, it's all using the default mapper. Um, and so uh, prior to, uh, during the analysis phase of a task, we can make a call out to a mapping object um, that we request from the application to provide information about where it would want to map a task. Um, so if you have a lot of data generated from a task, you might want it to run on the exact same CPU, the same new, uh, maybe the same NUMA domain, um, uh, depending on the structure of the application. Um, right now we're using a default mapper that has some embedded heuristics. Um, I'm not gonna get to uh, the, uh, the details of writing a mapper in this uh, demonstration, uh, but um, uh, there, there's some complexity, but they're fairly short. So as an example, um, the S3D mapper, um, if you exclude some of the boilerplate associated with the C++, is about 1,000 lines of code. Um, which isn't too bad given the size of the rest of the application. Um, but to get started, um, to start running applications, you don't have to worry about the mapper at all. Um, so let's take a, a look at another um, example. So far I've been showing you tasks that, um, uh, that are just using task parallelism, um, uh, applications that are just doing task parallelism. But we should jump into one that shows kind of a, a data parallelism um, example, uh, or a for all style parallelism, I should say in this case. Um, and that's in uh, tasks3.rg. Uh, so this is actually gonna invoke a uh, printer multiple times. Um, and, it's, uh, and so you, you'll actually see that fine grained task being executed uh, 100 times in this instance. Um, so let's, uh, let's run that and see what we get. I'll go straight to uh, Q-subbing the, uh, um, the profiled version of that. And let's put it in prof 10. And you should see many, many more tasks now. Are folks, uh, did folks get to this? No? Okay. So I'll narrow in on a few of these. And I'll take, a, if you see, each one of these is a printer task. And there's many different printer tasks running concurrently. Um, they're all executed from main. Um, What's interesting is if we look, if we go back to uh, the example, um, there's no dependency uh, between main and printer, right? We're not consuming any data from printer. And so main actually completes uh, prior to all of the other tasks, um, which is a little counterintuitive um, uh, to, to other application applications that you've probably worked uh, on in the past. Um, we may have gotten lucky, and we may also um, have gotten out of order execution. I'll take a look at the output file, rp3.sho299 in, uh, in my case. And we did. So tasks don't necessarily have to execute in order um, if there's no uh, dependencies between them. The runtime's free to just farm, up, farm them out. Uh, and so it can, uh, it can obtain additional parallelism um, that might otherwise be difficult uh, to, to program. These, these are somewhat trivial examples, but should give you a flavor for what that looks like. Um, so let's take a look at a slightly more involved uh, example, uh, tasks4.rg. 
um, where there's a dependency, um, and we'll look at positive tasks and negative tasks. Um, where positive tasks print a, a positive integer, negative tasks print the negative integer. Um, and the task for negative five, for example, actually depends on the task for five. Um, and you'll see how the runtime actually enforces that. Um, um, uh, and we'll try to use Legion Spy to, um, uh, to take a look at that. Ah, the utility processor, yes. I, uh, and I should have spent a little bit more time on that. Um, but what the utility processor is doing is all the dynamic analysis of the application. So as the, as the application is executing, if you will, running through the sequential code, it's queuing up each one of those tasks onto, uh, within the runtime. And it's not executing it immediately. Um, you can think of it as a deferred execution environment, or um, if you compare it to an out-of-order processor, um, it's the look-ahead um, of the instruction stream. Um, and that's how much we can queue, which is configurable in the low-level runtime if you want to. Um, but that provides um, work. Um, that dynamic analysis has to be done somewhere, and so that gets pushed off to a set of utility processors. Um, in this case, um, it looks like we have a single utility processor um, involved. And you can see some of the things that the utility processor does. Um, in particular, uh, where it's doing physical dependence analysis for, um, for data dependencies, as an example. Um, I haven't gone through all of these. Uh, there shouldn't be, uh, it can do slicing operations. Um, this is a high level scheduler operation. If the application is running on a distributed uh, network, um, distributed system, um, you can also see DMA tasks where it's moving data um, between uh, different processors or memories in the system, as an example. Um, but uh, it's important to note that this is going on and it's taking resources away from your application. So there's a balance of um, how much additional parallelism can you get. Um, and uh, um, but we find that we can generally hide uh, much of this uh, for, for um, complex applications. Yep. What's the example you have a lot going on on processor four, not so much on processor two? Is that because you don't, in order to get good runtime, you don't really need to balance the number of tasks? It's because we're using just a heuristic within the default mapper. Um, uh, it, it's, it's looking at CPU utilization, uh, or can look at CPU utilization to make scheduling decisions, or it can round robin, for instance, based on a heuristic. Um, in this example, it'd probably be just as good to put everything on, a CP, on CPU zero, um, because that's not doing much. Um, but the, def the default mapper will try to get utilization out of all the CPUs if it can. Um, and, and we'll see uh, more examples of that in a bit. So um, let's take a look at Legion Spy. So what is Legion Spy? It's a tool for showing ordering uh, uh, of dependencies between tasks. Um, so this is a way of you looking and seeing what is Legion um, extracting from my application in terms of the data dependencies. Um, and from that, you can often do optimizations. Um, so if you have tasks um, uh, or task dependencies in, in terms of control, uh, you can see that through Legion Spy. So this is helpful um, oftentimes in understanding how your application is behaving within the, the Legion runtime. Um, and it's also very useful uh, in particular for finding out why things aren't necessarily running in parallel when you think they should be. Um, and so we'll try to take a look at that next. So go to uh, Boot Camp Tasks. Um, and, uh, and then QSUB, uh, rs4.sh, uh, um, and then try to do a make spy. Um, and I'll do the same thing. And in this case, it put the data flow, and it'll show you in this last line here, uh, under tilde public HTML uh, spy or public underscore HTML spy.pdf. So if you go back to your uh, web browser and 
just replace the prof the slash prof dot uh, whatever number you had with spy.pdf. It's pretty simple, but it'll illustrate the point. Um, in that, in this example, we have the negative t the negative uh, printer task being dependent on the positive printer task, and so while it can extract parallelism, there's dependencies between those tasks in which they have to run as pairs, um, and a way of seeing that visually is through Legion Spy, um, and it's actually uh, assigning identifiers to each one of these tasks, um, and then uh, indicating that there's um, a an N64 operation between those two, um, probably the, ne the negation um, operation, if I had to go and look. Um, we could take a look at that quickly. Why don't we? So if we take a look at 4.rg. Yep. So you'll see that the return value of printer sub i is j, which can be treated as a future and passed to printer again, um, but we're negating the value. And so Legion Spy is showing us um, the, the execution of those operations um, and the dependencies um, between them. So let's do a, a, a slightly more complex example. Um, and uh, you saw this earlier, right? So this is, I didn't plan on it, it's perfect. Um, um, we throw darts, we try to figure out uh, the, um, the area, uh, and, uh, and from that we can calculate pi. Um, and you'll actually be able to see the code within a single, uh, with, uh, within a single terminal in this instance. Um, if it was, uh, to be fair, if it was the Legion, Le Legion C++ API, you wouldn't. Um, there's a lot of boilerplate in that as well. Uh, so uh, let's first open up uh, under um, pi uh, 1.rg. Right? And it has a single task called hit um, that's actually doing the random number generation and sampling within the space. Um, and then we just loop over it for uh, uh, a large number of iterations, uh, a thousand in this case, um, and um, aggregate the results. Um, and you see that here. So it's going to execute this hits task uh, uh, 10,000 times, I should say. Um, and then it'll print out the, uh, the, uh, 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 the approximate um, area of a unit circle. Uh, so. Let's go ahead and execute that um, with r1. Dot, or uh, let's well we'll go ahead and profile it. Do rp1.sh. Um, and if you cat the output file, take a look and see. Oh. If I go to the right directory, sorry. You can tell multiple people are using the cloud instance now because it's not quite so uh, uh, instantaneous feedback, but it's pretty quick still. Uh, so we get a fairly poor estimate, but we get an estimate of what pi is, 3.16, um, 3.2. So Seems to be behaving uh, reasonably well. Um, let's do make prof. Okay, so this one uh, executed in about 11 seconds, right? So that's pretty, pretty slow. Um, Let's see what let's see what's going on in uh, in the prof output. Um, so in this case, it's prof eleven. I see a lot of dead time. All right. So if we look at CPU zero, um, you'll see 
it's it's got uh, a lot of dead time. It's got absolute dead time here, and then even here, the utilization is just in uh, is just quite low. You know, four percent. It's a little spiking here to thirty five percent. If we go down and look and see what our tasks look like, um, the response of the website might be a little uh, the web uh, through the web browser might be a little bit less now because it's having to render more. Um, but we see that we get a ton of little tasks, right? Um, each one of those is a hits task. Um, some of them it'll show merged because they're so close together, it just merges all of those tasks. If I was to um, highlight a smaller section, I would be able to see those. But there's, you know, if you wanted to, you could go through and look through these, and there's 10,000 of them. Um, and they're all executing uh, across multiple CPUs. But there's still a lot of dead time. Um, and these are extremely fine-grained tasks. Uh, so another approach is to, uh, is to get a little bit more coarse-grained tasks. Um, and, uh, and I won't go through the exercise here because we only have a half hour. I'll just show you the, the, um, the actual code. Um, let's open up another example of calculating pi called x1.rg. And do me a, a favor, um, on or about line 26, um, yours will probably show something that looks like Terra. Change it to task. Um, that was my fault, I apologize. I'll, I'll explain what the Terra does in a moment. Um, but what, is this, uh, what does this do? Well, we lift a number of the iterations actually to the hits um, task. Um, so rather than uh, doing a single top-level task with, um, with 10,000 tiny little tasks um, running the, uh, the sample, um, we pass into hit the number of iterations of the number of samples we want it to take. And so we coarsen. Um, and this would be probably one of the... Um, uh, one of the areas where it's more art rather than science as to how to get reasonable performance out of a task-based runtime system. And that is, how granular should your tasks be? And it depends on a couple of different factors, but, um, but in general, you want your, ta your tasks to be, um, say, microseconds, um, multiple microseconds, um, to deal with uh, runtime overheads. Um, you don't want 100 cycles um, you know, or 100 nanos, if you will, uh, of, uh, uh, of, um, of task execution time, because you'll never hide, hide it, right? Um, the runtime uh, overheads are just too high. But it's similar to what you would see within an OpenMP threaded loop, um, in that you don't want the body of your loop to be extremely tiny if it's just like one you know, or a handful of instructions, often the, the, the performance isn't great, unless you just happen to be getting pure vectorization um, and not thread parallelism. Um, so uh, that's what this example shows. Um, let's look at what um, the performance of this looks like or what the Legion Prof um, output looks like. Um, we'll do Q sub RP um, X1 uh, dot SH. and make prof. And now you should have a prof 12. And let's take a look at that. It should be a little bit more uh, reasonable. Um, you'll also note that my runtime, instead of being 11 seconds, is um, a tenth or a hundredth of a second. Um, so it improved runtime quite a bit just by coarsening the task size. Um, and we'll see that, um, ideally, in the, uh, in the Legion Prof output. And we do. We still see some dead time here. Um, but the utilization is significantly higher, 50% utilization instead of 5% utilization um, when we had too many uh, tasks running concurrently. Um, and so we're able to amortize runtime overheads over a, 
a, a, a smaller number of larger tasks um, and get a reasonable performance. Um, yes, absolutely. The elapsed time that you're recording here, I'm wondering how internally you're doing the bookkeeping for it. Is it like just the lifetime of each task then accumulated or are you doing it like start to finish wall time? This is start to, uh, this will be start to finish uh, wall time. It should be um, not, not for the Q sub. Um, so you should see, for instance, um, this is uh, 7,000 microseconds. So seven, uh, uh, seven milliseconds, which equates roughly to the, um, it probably goes off a little bit on the Legion prof set. I think I narrowed this in already. Um, Yep. So this ends at approximately, the, the pro profiling ends at 7,000 microseconds. Um, but it includes all this dead time, too, for the startup. So it's start to, start to finish is what those uh, prof values are showing. So it could be the case that the, actually, the, since you're profiling, it could be actually a bit even slower than it would be. Yes, that's right. Um, and we could try that. Um, let's see, do I have a non-profile version? Um, that's a good question. I have a spy version. I don't just have an RX one. Um, we could change it and remove the profiling, but I don't believe it'll make that much of a difference in this case. Um, the other thing you can do, is, rather than, um, uh, you can also use Terra to lower these tasks um, through LLVM, um, so you actually get a more optimized code. Yep. Yes. It looks like they, they are running in serial. They are not running in parallel of multiprocessors. It's one after the other. It's not one on top of the other. Yeah, it should be, uh, it should be able to run them concurrently um, in this case. Um, a control on that, or it's just up to the runtime? It's, uh, you can force things to run at the exact same time, um, but you end up having to expose constructs like epic launchers, um, uh, which we don't generally su suggest. Um, if there were more tasks in this example, you would see them running. Uh, you would see some of them overlapping, at least some. Um, uh, but it's a good question. It's up to the runtime to make those um, scheduling decisions. There's not dependencies, though, between these tasks. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and in the previous example, showed the concurrent execution a little bit better because there were 10,000 of them. So you're going to get, um, but the, the overhead is, is, is too high to get performance out of that approach. Um, the cool thing is, if you want um, better performance, you can just change. Uh, the task attribute of hits to Terra. And then we'll lower this um, to LLVM uh, upon uh, prior to first invocation. Um, there's a project called Terra Lua um, that this project has borrowed from to get that technology. It also provides vector intrinsics or, or can vectorize your code and use underlying vector intrinsics on the platform. Um, we won't go into the uh, we won't go into a vectorization example, but uh, we've seen t uh, we've seen instances where uh, we take an application, we compile it with um, with the Regent compiler, and we'll get better serial performance um, uh, in in some cases uh, because we're actually doing more aggressive optimization, um, or can potentially do more aggressive optimization. Um, so. It, uh, I will quickly execute that as well. Output still looks good. Roughly the same amount of time. So a little bit, uh, perhaps a little bit of runtime difference, but in this case, uh, not, uh, uh, not significant. But if you have more complex math going on um, or more uh, operations within the body of that loop, um, you would uh, potentially get uh, significant performance improvements um, just by uh, attributing it with Terra. Um, the downside to that uh, is that the Legion prof diagram uh, gets a bit munged. Um, 
because it'll actually do, it only sees through to a single Terra task. So you'll see that it's just a single main. It doesn't see the, um, you lose uh, some of the profiling capabilities um, when you attribute with Terra. Um, so probably better not to attribute things with Terra to start with so you understand what's going on and optimize in that fashion and then uh, case by case trying uh, to use Terra to lower through LLVM. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take an ex uh, uh, let's move forward with um, regions. I want to at least quickly get to, the, uh, to a few of these examples. Um, so I went over regions earlier, uh, typed collection, um, and that's important. The, the compiler can do analysis on usage of the logical region um, because it is strongly typed. Um, and they're cross product of an index space and a field space. So take a look at structured regions uh, slash one dot RG. It's a simple um, bit field in this example. And you'll see that the first thing we do is actually define the field space. Um, bit field, bit, and the type, in this case, bool. Um, we then construct uh, within uh, the um, body of, uh, of the task, of the top level task, in this case, main, um, the index space. And here's where we actually create that index space. Um, we're saying it's a 1D index space. Um, and uh, uh, of size uh, 10. And then we create a logical region here. So bit region, uh, region, we cross product the uh, indices that we created here with the call to I space uh, with the actual bit field. So now we have a logical region. Um, there's uh, no mem uh, very little memory associated with um, these calls because we haven't put anything in that logical region. It won't actually instantiate it until you use it. Um, so you can make it as big as you want, which is a question we get from developers quite often, is how big should I make my logical region? You can make it as large as you'd like to. Um, you can't possibly map it all if it's, uh, if it's uh, too large, um, but you can make it large enough, for instance, to hold an entire distributed mesh across uh, 100,000 processors. Uh, you'd have to use 64-bit index, uh, indexing to do so, but you can. Um, and so here's an example um, of one style of actually updating elements in a logical region, uh, where we're actually um, looping over uh, each element B in that bit region and, and updating a value. Um, and then later on, um, we'll actually um, output uh, by reading that value um, and, uh, and using c.printf uh, within that logical region. So the syntax of regent is for all style. You can use like for all style constructs uh, uh, within uh, to access uh, logical regions um, and use them uh, very similar to the way you would use uh, regular memory um, or say a standard vector um, in C++. Um, let's take a look at 2.rg. So in this instance, um, we actually, uh, we introduce a couple of tasks. Um, one that's going to initialize uh, our logical region. Um, and what you'll note here is that the task syntax has changed slightly. Um, in particular, uh, we declare uh, within the task um, what, uh, what data it's going to be um, accessing within the logical region um, and how it actually uh, accesses it. So task clear will be um, accessing uh, the, um, this region, um, I space of int ID, uh, 1D, and a bit field. Um, and it's going to write uh, bit region dot bit. And then the printer task is actually going to 
um, is going to actually read that logical region. Um, and so we attribute the task um, with that. Um, and then uh, we can call our uh, clear and then printer tasks. Um, and the Legion runtime knows how, excuse me, apparently I got a meeting to go to. Um, it'll, uh, <laughs> Procopa, which is an ECP project. Um, <laughs> we're, we're collaborating with them a bit. Um, so uh, you can, uh, and I see one of the members in the audience here who I'm working on uh, some of the Copa uh, project. Um, but, uh, uh, or collaborating with them. Um, so in, the, in this, uh, but in this example, um, uh, we've attributed the, both the clear and the printer tasks so that we know how it's accessing that data and how it will, um, uh, how those tasks can be scheduled. Um, let's see if we can get to a slightly more complex example in the short time that we have left. So let's go into 3.rg. Um, and in this case, um, we introduce another task, um, which is called clear um, bit region, which is, uh, sorry, blink uh, bit region, um, which is going to change the value. Um, it's going to both read and write. Um, whereas clear just did a writing and printer just did a reading um, of that data. Let's uh, run that one. So you should be able to QSub RP3, I believe. Sorry. Let me clean this up. Oh, just R3 in this case. And we at least get the right, is, right, right uh, result. Um, so in this case, the clear operation fills the logical region. The blinker goes through and changes each value from 0 to 1. And then we print out the results. And those tasks um, are managed by the runtime. Um, let's see if we can't get. Um, so, uh, so what we showed in. Uh, in attributing tasks um, with the logical regions that they'll operate on and what specific values that they're going to be, or fields that they'll be operating on within a logical region is how we actually, um, we, we think of that as uh, uh, denoting the privileges that tasks have on logical regions within, uh, within the Legion programming model. Um, we have Alternative um, uh, privileges, uh, so you can actually um, provide uh, you can provide reduction privileges. So rather than um, doing read write, um, you can do uh, reduction operations. Let's take a look at um, four dot rg. Oh. Sorry, I should have put a dash n w in there. And I'll pull up 5.rg. And the, the main difference um, is that this is showing an example in 5.rg of rather than just having a read or write um, uh, permission, um, we can actually do a reduction operation. And a reduction operation is actually another hint to the runtime. Um, so the runtime can actually execute these concurrently, but then it has to fold the operations into a common instance. Um, and so you can describe that pattern within, uh, within Legion and within the Regent uh, system uh, pretty naturally by uh, just annotating uh, the privileges. Um, there's some trade-offs to be made because the runtime will actually make copies of the underlying physical instances so that it can execute um, multiple reduction operate multiple uh, reductions uh, simultaneously, and then fold those to a common instance. Um, but the runtime manages that uh, uh, completely uh, for you. Um, but to get true data style parallelism, which is where I wanted to get to, um, we actually have to partition a logical region. Um, and so we'll finish with that in the uh, in the six minutes that I have left, according to the clock up there. 
Um, so if we want us to expose data parallelism um, within a logical region, we need to partition it. And uh, we have quite a few sets of, uh, we, we've got a fairly rich set of partitioning primitives within uh, Legion and Regent. Uh, I'd encourage you uh, uh, to take a look at um, a, a paper called Dependent Partitioning, um, where you can, uh, particularly for uh, unstructured uh, meshes um, or even structured meshes, we provide a set of operations that allow us to partition um, uh, fairly complex geometries so that then we can do data parallel operations across them. So let's do an example of partitioning. Um, so in this case, we can partition that bit field, say, into two different partitions. And if you go to, um, under the partitioning directory, I believe we have an example of this. So if you take a look at 1.rg at line, looks like 68, you'll see the call to actually partitioning that bit re region into num pieces. And in this case, we're partitioning it into six pieces. Um, uh, num pieces equals six. Um, and then based on that partitioning of that bit region, we can then do for all style parallelism across a partition. So here's an example of um, a parallel task execution, data parallel, across that logical region. Um, I don't have to uh, invoke individual tasks um, uh, across this um, uh, uh, manually. Um, I can just loop across each one of those partitions and then execute. Um, uh, I can execute across that, that specific coloring. And the runtime actually manages the parallel execution of those. Um, so if we can try to do a, um, execute that. So you should see an rp1.sh. And if you do a make prof, it should generate a new uh, profile. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Mine's prof 15 in this instance. I'll zoom in on that. Open up node 0. And you'll see that I have multiple blink operations executing concurrently rather than just one, or actually um, trying to execute concurrently based uh, across multiple CPUs. Um, those are being executed um, if we have more processors in the, and, and more tasks in this example. Um, we'd see those overlapping um, or running concurrently. Uh, but we got natural parallelism out of that by just partitioning uh, our logical region and then doing for all style parallelism across it. Um, and it's the runtime's responsibility for then managing the execution of those tasks. Um, so uh, fairly simple to, uh, to get started and program in um, uh, with, uh, with the region compiler. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit more uh, challenging to use the Legion C++ API. Um, and so what, uh, what we found with a number of uh, 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 Area, a number of areas that we're working in, uh, we often have somebody working on a region application so we can start understanding performance and what the right constructs are to use in that specific application domain. And then shortly after that, embark on uh, developing uh, the application within uh, the Legion C++ API or moving parts of an existing application to the Legion C++ API. Um, I wasn't able to cover all aspects of, uh, of Legion and Regent in this talk, but this should give you at least a flavor. Um, and if you have uh, more questions, uh, find me. Um, I think I have a couple minutes if there's questions, general questions or specifics. Okay. Thank
Thanks. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so, so the low, lower level runtime of Legion is, uh, is called Realm, um, and it's actually built on GasNet. Um, so we partner with the GasNet EX um, project. Um, it is, uh, so uh, one could argue that, uh, that Legion is a PGAS uh, style programming language. It is. Um, I think the one, uh, the one major difference, which we didn't cover here, um, is that uh, one, it introduces the concept of tasks and managing those tasks and execution of those tasks. Um, but it also allows you to provide multiple partitions of the same data. Um, so I didn't show that here, but you can have multiple views of the same logical region partitioned in different ways. And then you can have multiple tasks executing on those different partitions. And it's the runtime's responsibility for determining the data dependencies between all of those. And that's important uh, for some classes, for quite a few classes of applications. Um, uh, in particular, if you're wanting to iterate over um, uh, data in a different way, um, or um, using uh, uh, another somewhat unique feature, um, the ability to have aliased points in your partitioned partition. So partitions don't have to be completely disjoint. They can overlap. You can have points that exist in both partitions concurrently. And so for updating, say, shared vertices in a mesh, um, uh, you, you can naturally say that that's aliased between two different processors. But other elements of the uh, mesh may be uh, completely disjoint, um, uh, in, and you could have a different partition for that. Um, so uh, I, I went a bit further than you asked, but yes, it's built upon GasNet, um, and it is uh, 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 characterized as a PGAS uh, style language. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Jonathan. So, just a comment. Um, yes. What I like about Legion in Region is that you don't have to think about how your algorithm can be parallelized. You just tell Legion where you're reading data, where you're writing data, and it figures it out for you. And Region, I don't know if you mentioned this, you can write one Region program, it'll run GPU or CPU. You don't have to change it. Yeah. It'll automatically target the back end. And Jonathan's done a lot of work with applications, knows. Uh, a lot of the details of, uh, of, of Legion and, and Region, so uh, he's a very good resource. Um, so. Yes, sir. So do you feel that in the future that these sorts of dependency graph analysis programming languages are going to replace our current models, or maybe we might introduce them into the current languages, like you said, through new uh, directives or I, I think so. I think a lot of the concepts, I, I think it, both, right? That um, uh, you will see more advanced programming systems like Legion or um, HPX or Charm++, even though Charm++ has been around a while, but, uh, you know, different uh, concepts um, continuing to, to, uh, um, to make headway as, uh, as the complexity of our applications grows and um, the scale and the complexity of the platforms that we're targeting um, is, is increasing. Um, I think you'll also see a trickle-down effect where some of the concepts um, that are developed in these programming systems are then adopted by um, OpenMP or the C++ Standardization Committee um, uh, by, uh, by MPI um, for uh, providing um, uh, improved uh, uh, semantics that, um, that we can build a, a, a top of. Uh, so I think it'll be a mixture of both. Thank you.